Uh, we're going to move from uh, the stable Fontan survivor and the failing Fontan into the transplant section. And we're going to start off with uh, Dr. Arnold Boss, who did his medical school at UT Southwestern, then did his residency training at Michigan, and then uh, cardiology at University of Washington. He is the director of the CCU, and as well as the director of the uh, UCLA Heart Failure uh, Fellowship Program, and he's going to talk to us about um, evaluating our patients. Well, thanks for inviting me. This is really fun to be here. I'm impressed at the turnout, so congratulations all of you who made a trip here to come. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the heart transplant evaluation process and with some you know, impact on our patients with Fontan physiology. So the overview is a little historical background. We'll talk a little bit about advanced therapies, the selection process for transplant, both inclusion and exclusion, as well as finally how we, how we get there. So history, uh, we're now about 52 years since the first, post, first transplant. Many of you probably remember this, but uh, 1967, December 3rd, we have Christian Barnard who uh, was working at Cape Town at the time. There he is in, on Time Magazine. So he was working in South Africa, but he had spent time in the US. He had actually worked with uh, Norm Shumway and Richard Lower and the Minnesota group, and he'd actually picked up the technique and kind of surprised the world with the first transplant. Uh, the donor was a poor woman that uh, she and her mom were killed by, by walking across the street in Cape Town. And then the first patient was uh, Louis Woshkonsky. He was a guy with ischemic cardiomyopathy. He lived 18 days, dying of pneumonia. And they actually thought he was rejecting, so they were giving him more steroids and more Imuran. When it turned out, he actually had uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, pneumonia, and he died from sepsis. So the technique caught on. and. Uh, over the ensuing years, transplant picked up. Initially, there was a excitement in the late 60s, early 70s, but the physicians and immunologists didn't figure out how to do immunology or how to manage these transplant patients. And so after three or four years, most centers gave up. But places like Stanford and Medical College of Virginia pressed on. Uh, and then by 1982, 83, a new medicine came along. You can see here the number of transplants picked up, centers restarted, and that was the advent of cyclosporin with better immunosuppression. And you can see now, over the last 30, 35 years, worldwide, this is from the ISHLT, there's probably around 5,000 or so transplants, 2,500 or so in, in the US North America. And that's been fairly steady. And if we look at centers doing transplant, you know, the majority of centers are doing you know, 10 to 20 transplants a year. The bigger centers, like us here at UCLA, are doing you know, 50 plus heart transplants a year. But a lot of centers are doing you know, less than 20. So at the same time that transplant developed, uh, physicians were working on the uh, problem of the sing single ventricle physiology, uh, tricuspid atresia, and you heard all about this this morning, you know, these two characters here, um, uh, Francis Fontan and Guillermo Kreutzer, developed a series of operations, you know, the traditional Fontan lateral tunnel eventually, and then the, we now have the uh, extra extracardiac Fontan, which is the, the current procedure. But Fontan was working in France and in, in the 1960s, and he did his first procedure for tricuspid atresia in 68. And this was a ventricularization of the RA. And he published that in 71 with a three case series. And then Kreutzer was working in Argentina, and he did also his first procedure in 71 with an atrial pulmonary connection and published that in 73. And then this procedure obviously exploded. Uh, There's probably 800 Fontan procedures performed annually. And this is the last kind of review that I found that uh, five decades of Fontan procedure, you know, almost 10,000 patients, 40 surgical centers, 31 published studies. You can see here in North America, more than 4,000. And these are the published ones. These aren't the ones that aren't published. But, you know, California here, we have lots in Michigan. Uh, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, et cetera, the European centers here that were in the publications, 20,000, I mean 2,000 or so patients, Asia, and then uh, New Zealand, Australia. But the problem is, as you heard this morning, is that this is a palliative procedure. Uh, patients end up having problems, cardiac problems like effusions. They can get, you know, arrhythmias due to high venous pressure. We get cirrhosis. We'll talk more about that. They get stasis from thrombosis. There's plastic bronchitis. There are connections that develop because of hypoxia. They can get aortopulmonary collaterals. They can get aortovenous collaterals. They can get venovenous collaterals. All these can present surgical problems. 
and they can get protein losing enteropathy. All this makes this limiting for the, for the Fontan patient. So medical therapy over the years has developed a series of, of plans. I mean, we can whip the horse, give the horse more digoxin or inotropes and make the horse work better, and that's the heart. We can unload it by giving it uh, diuretics and afterload reduction. We can slow the horse with digoxin and evabradine. We can heal the horse. That happens with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with medications. Or we can get a new horse, which is a tractor, I mean, I mean a transplant, or get a tractor, which is a VAD. And so that's kind of what the rest of this talk is about, um, the advanced therapies for, for end-stage heart failure. And so we have heart transplant, which, which is most of what I'm talking about, and then we have ventricular assist devices. And so in the, in the Fontan literature, there has been really isolated use of, of VADs. Uh, there's been uh, cases of total artificial heart syncardia with the Fontan patient being bridged to transplant. There have been cases of HVADs and, and uh, heart mates being used to bridge a failing systemic ventricle to transplant, but very isolated uses. So what's our experience? Uh, Dr. Reard and others here have published uh, our UCLA experience that we had uh, from 2002 to 2017 of 20 failing Fontan patients who underwent either heart transplant or combined heart-liver transplant. 15 of them had heart transplant. We had five with combined heart-liver transplant. And the median age was around 20, about 30, age 19 to 44. Uh, there were some post-operative complications they reported. 50% had bleeding. 40% uh, required uh, surgical re-intervention for that bleeding. The median follow-up was 56 months, and the survival was pretty good. We had one patient die 34 months post-transplant for TCAD with a 95% survival at, at uh, uh, 56 months. And the length of stay, obviously, just for isolated transplant was lower, 23 days. And if you had the combined heart-liver, it was a longer uh, stay. But here's the paradox. So it's all about timing and, and selection. So these patients are very sick, but also can be stable at the same time. So they're sick enough to need a heart transplant or mechanical circulatory support without other treatment problems. But they're also well, are they well enough to survive this therapy and still have good quality of life? And so as a team, we are really uh, need to do due diligence to, because of the limited organ availability, assess and create a societal responsibility to carefully select the recipients most likely to survive and have a good quality of life. And so it's all about timing. We could move forward with transplant or mechanical circulatory support before irreversible organ damage, malnutrition, muscle weakness, et cetera, infection develops. We want to avoid going too soon because upfront risk may shorten life. These procedures have complications and risks, and there's always new therapies coming along to, uh, to palliate and to keep the patients stable. And then we can also use uh, devices like MCS as a bridge to transplant, correcting heart failure, or if patients are severely allosensitized, we can desensitize them when they're on a VAD for support and eventually make them a better candidate in time for a heart transplant. So the valuation has three kind of components. First is the heart. You know, there's basically are there no other therapies that will improve the status of the heart uh, for survival and quality of life? Then there's the rest of the patient. Uh, are the organs, besides the heart, are they healthy? Can they survive the surgery and the effects of mechanical circulatory support or the medications used after transplant? Then finally, it's everything outside of the patient. Do they have the adequate psychosocial support? Is there enough family support to get them through this process? Do they have adequate transportation to come to clinic for biopsies, et cetera? And then do they have the finances, the disability? Do they have insurance? I mean, are the prescription problems that when they get listed and get new medications, they can't pay for them? So these are the things that are impor important to evaluate. So at UCLA, our general acceptance criteria is follows. You know, you need to have some poor predictor of survival. We often use the heart failure survival score or the Seattle heart failure model. And those are mostly for, for our non-congenital uh, patients. Typically, if you have survival of uh, less than 90% in one year, you tend to do better with transplant. We also use peak VO2, and sometimes we use less than 12 uh, cc's per kilo per minute in the patients on beta blockers, but we also should age adjust this because certainly younger patients will be higher. Uh, class three and class four heart failure refractory to maximum medical therapy is indication. Uh, severely limiting ischemia, refractory to surgical interventional revascularization, uh, recurrent symptomatic refractory arrhythmias to medical ICD and surgical treatment, mechanical assist device, and these are all general accepted criteria. 
Now, there are some absolute contraindications, and most of these are obvious. If you have active infection or sepsis, you can't be immunosuppressed. Is there current or documented non-adherence? This is a big deal with medical therapy or follow-up that are perceived to increase the risk of non-adherence after transplant. Is there evidence of active drug, tobacco, alcohol use, or abuse? This is a problem. Um, severe or treatable psychiatric, psychological, or neurological conditions that likely impose a significant threat to compliance with a complex medical regimen. Active, recent, or disseminated malignancy. This does not include you know, local, localizable non-melanoma skin cancers. Absence of a, or a lack of consistent or reliable social support system. A primary and backup caregiver is necessary because these patients got to come to clinic. They've got to be seen. And if the patient has been transplanted and can't come to the clinic for follow-up, that's actually a, a real recipe for disaster. And finally, patients who have prior cardiac surgery are required combined organ transplant and are unwilling to accept blood products because these patients are going to bleed. And so we do do isolated heart transplants in uh, non-prior thoracotomy patients who can't take blood products, but not in patients who've had prior uh, surgery or combined organ transplants. All right, what are the relative contraindications? So this is really things like irreversible pulmonary hypertension. You know, we want PVRs typically less than three. Um, chronic renal impairment for isolated heart transplant if the patient's not a candidate for concomitant renal transplant. Likewise, significant chronic hepatic impairment for isolated heart transplant if the patient's not a candidate for liver transplant. Uh, advanced systemic disease is an issue, obviously, that would interfere with successful clinical outcome. The patient is underweight, BMI less than 18 or overweight, BMI greater than 35, severe malnutrition, uh, either by clinical assessment, serum albumin or pre-albumin, advanced lung disease, do they have restrictive lung physiology or bad COPD, any coagulopathy would make a, make a problem, diabetes with severe end organ damage. We will transplant diabetics, but if they have severe end organ damage, it's an issue. And then inability to make a conform, informed consent regarding whether or not you want a transplant. And finally, if you have a combined risk factors that are expected to prohibit any beneficial outcome from uh, transplant for the patient. So what's some of the testing that patients undergo? They undergo an echocardiogram, obviously, to evaluate cardiac function. Um, in some patients, we will do a left heart catheterization to rule out coronary disease. There's always a right heart catheterization to assess filling pressures, PVR. Uh, it's very important to get uh, a chest abdomen CT to look at uh, anatomy from prior surgeries, are there, you know, collaterals present uh, to help, this is to help strategize the surgical process, and then vascular studies to look at uh, venous and arterial problems. Special labs that we need, we need single antigen testing, are they allosensitized? This is very, very problematic if patients have had prior surgeries and they are alloimmunized, and that's going to limit the, the availability of hearts. Uh, looking for infection, CMV, HIV, hepatitis, and, and COXI status, uh, TB status, and obviously drugs of abuse. Other studies are PFTs, looking for restrictive or obstructive lung disease. We do a CPX, as we mentioned, and in certain patients, they'll need colonoscopy and or mammogram, pap smears up to date. So it's a team process, and this is really the most important thing. There's a group, there are physicians that are involved in selection. There's the transplant cardiologist, the surgeons, the congenital heart disease specialist, our hepatologists, our infectious disease doctors, pulmonary medicine, Everybody here, nephrology, psychiatry, we have ethicists sometimes involved at selection committee. We have frailty specialists to evaluate how, how weak they are, dentists and then other specialists if needed. Our nurses play a key role in this, so our cardiomyopathy nurses, the congenital heart disease nurses, our transplant coordinators, and our MCS coordinators are huge in, in evaluating the patients. And finally, we need other caregivers. We need social workers. We need advanced care planning. All our patients are seen by palliative care specialists. There are pharmacists that look over their medications. Are there any issues with medication interactions? A dietitian will see them, and obviously a financial counselor. And all these people come to selection committee. There we present the patient and make a decision. Are they an adequate candidate for a, a transplant or not? Once somebody is deemed an adequate transplant candidate, I think the most important thing is preoperative uh, surgical planning. And this has been very successful for our most complex patients, especially patients with Fontan physiology that are undergoing either heart or heart liver transplant. So the most complex patients require pre-surgical planning. The donor organ age is, is indicated, what's going to be our, our size, what's going to be our travel distance. Immunogenetics is important. You know, are they allosensitized? Are we going to induce them? Are we going to do desensitization? 
We want to optimize the recipient before transplant. Many of these Fontan patients are volume overloaded. Maybe they have collaterals that need to be addressed. They should come in the hospital. Should they be on, on inotropes prior? And then surgical planning between the different teams. So between the procurement team and the transplant surgeons, very, very important. How much you know, pulmonary artery cuff, vein cuff they need, et cetera. Our anesthesiologists are critical, critical in planning with the surgical teams for operative uh, strategies. And then post-operative care with our critical team is also very, very important. So finally, if patients aren't really candidate for these things, it's important to have a palliative care discussion. And so for patients who are not candidates or do not want advanced therapies, it's really important to focus on the quality of life, define wishes for heroic therapy, CPR, ICD shocks, admission to the hospital. And for those patients who have had advanced therapies, it's really important to define the goals of care. So what are the end of life decisions, when to turn off MCS, because these are really important that patients have autonomy and the families have autonomy in decision processes. So I think I'm going to end here, because this is the transition to Dr. De Pasquale. We now have a new listing uh, criteria from UNOS that went in effect as of October 2018, and he's going to cover that in his talk.